I'm Tim Ventura from AmericanAntiGravity.com, and I'm joined today by Russell Anderson, who we've interviewed in the past, but Russell has a lot of news to share with us, including the fact that he is now in charge of Searle Aerospace. Well, Russell, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. How are you, Tim? I'm doing well. Well, we haven't talked in forever. I think you said 2004 was probably the last Eight years. Uh, Well, we talked, uh, but uh, we haven't had a phone interview in like eight years. Yeah, well, you know, I I think one of the things uh, for for people who haven't, you know, who aren't familiar with you, haven't heard our past interview, is you have been doing electrogravitics research for decades, and you have real expertise there. You're one of the top people in the country for it. Um, But the thing that also interested me when we touched base on the phone the other day was you were now working closely with the Searle organization, which is something that I, I know has been a dream of yours forever. Yeah, it's it's funny how, you know, if you fixate on something long enough and and intensely enough, it will actually happen. That's uh, you know, called the power of positive thinking or the power of uh, you know, just manifesting reality, you know, it really works. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, now so you're in charge of Searle Aerospace and then Searle Technologies Incorporated is the parent company for that, right? Yeah, Searle Aerospace Incorporated in the state of Nevada in July of 2010. Okay, okay. And and then the other one, if I remember right, cuz you're out in Pennsylvania, the other one is actually in California, the the parent company. Uh well, yeah, it's parent company, I believe is located in California, Searle Technologies Incorporated. It's a 501 FCC uh corporation. And uh, Searle Magnetics Incorporated uh, is also incorporated, uh, I believe, in 2010 also. And they've been operational in Southern California, not too far from L.A., since September of 2010, so just over two years. Oh, wow. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about what's going on right now? Or Well, they basically, with uh, magnetic mock-up models, been able to demonstrate the Searle effect, its motor ability, and the fact that, you know, to get this, like, uh, you know, pounds and pounds, like uh, eight, ten pounds worth of heavy magnets rotating and rolling about uh, their axes and going about 200 RPMs about uh, one stator plate in the SEG single plate and runner gyro cell. Uh, they've demonstrated that that is a very, very low voltage and current. It's about 1.5 volts at 600 milliamps, at 0.06 milliamps, to get all those uh, magnets rotating, uh, massive metals rotating around the uh, stator at about 200 RPM. So that already violates some very cherished laws. Uh, and that's all because of the unique magnet- magnetization method that's been proven by Chief uh, SEG Engineer Fernando Morris. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think most people have probably seen the video. And, and I'll tell you, I had seen... Lots of videos out there. there I, I've, seen, I've seen a few, and, and one of the older ones that I had seen, this was maybe back in around 2006, 2007, one of those first experiments where it was rotating. And I thought, that's it's very interesting. But I'll, I'll tell you, the one that got me was probably about a month ago, I saw the 200 RPM video, and that... I, I mean, yeah, th- those magnets are just whirling. Oh my, that's been out. Uh, those have been out for a while, for like past six years or so. Yeah. Now, since then, have they made have they made progress, or or is it kind of in a holding pattern? Well, just understanding, they've made progress in understanding, you know, what it takes to get that to happen, and uh, it's not, you know, really easy to get that to happen, you know, at that uh, that rotational speed with that little amount of power. What makes that happen is the unique magnetization coils that, you know, they're all there set up and ready to go for the stators and the rotors, which are the plates and the runners. The plates are the rings and the runners are the rollers, which are made up of, uh, normally made up of eight stacked uh, discs, you know, forming a cylinder. Well, you know, one of the things that was interesting to me is a lot of the things that have been described about the Searle effect over, I mean, some of these go back decades, right? Things that Searle himself has said and others have said. Um, You know, we see in that video, for instance, when it starts running, the magnets automatically space themselves. And I thought that was very interesting to see. Well, that's that's normal. That's, you know, normal with any, you know, normally magnetized, uh, you know, magnets, uh, 
you can get them to do that. That's that's just the, the repulsion of the magnets regularly spaced. Oh, and by the way, nominal SEG in the inner layer of a single plate and runner gyro cell to a three nominal three layer uh, SEG gyro cell. The inner layer of runners has to be 12. Has to be at least 12. Okay. And okay. what is happening there is really interesting. Um, it's uh, you know, everybody wants to try to think that uh, magnetic motors and the Searle effect generator, in particular, are weird and exotic and you know you know so out there. But they're really utilizing, as Professor Searle has said, but he says nobody listens, <laughs> that they're utilizing simple principles that we use every day in electromagnetics every single day. Yeah, yeah. All, all of us, and we're with the, we don't even realize it without even knowing it. For instance, uh, what is happening is that the uh, the plates, the ring, and the runners, uh, so the stators and the uh, rotors, rotating parts, are magnetized 90 degrees out of phase. Still there? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay, they're magnetized 90 degrees out of phase, and uh, they're magnetized with a special coil that uh, is a regular DC coil with one turn of AC wrapped around it, helical fashion. So uh, what is happening, those are, the DC and the AC are magnetized exactly simultaneous, and they have to be simultaneous because if everything's okay, you got your sums right, you got your frequencies right, power levels right, what will happen on the iron layers, and only the iron layers are magnetized, nothing else. Neodymium's not magnetized. Only the iron layers are magnetized. What you have when you bring a stator to or a runner uh, set to a stator is it makes a wave. It makes a sine wave, and uh, the runners are basically carried along in the trough of the wave. The wave is not stationary. It starts to move. It starts to move if you have you know everything you know all magnetized correctly. And that's because you're making with this uh, coil, the DC plus AC coil, the equivalent of helical magnetic gear teeth on the stators and the runners, the plates and the runners. And uh, that's an imbalance. In other words, there's no chance of magnetic lockup, which happens when you're building a magnetic motor and you don't have everything arranged quite right. You will have magnetic lockup. In other words, you'll have equilibrium in the system. The SEG is designed to have no equilibrium in the system. So what happens is as soon as you bring a stator, uh, a runner rather, to a stator, it forms this, uh, these two waves or uh, sine waves at 90 degrees to each other, and that makes a magnetic moving wave something completely unique. Uh, unless you've seen like a linear motor in, t in terms of Howard Johnson's patented magnetic motor. It started out as a linear motor. And what you're doing with this and Howard Johnson's motor is you're taking that linear motor and wrapping it into a circle. So you get continuous rotation. Yeah. And uh, it's really interesting what's going on there. And in the Law of the Squares, and I, I highly recommend everybody review, Google review the Law of the Squares, Look at any of Professor Searle's writings on the website or in the books or anything. Law of the Squares, ancient numerical system. On uh, the Law of the Squares, true SEG, where you have laminated elements. In other words, the inner element of the stators and the inner elements of the runner sets, that's neodymium. That can be any rare earth, but uh, they use, they've been using neodymium since the beginning, since 1946. Well, neodymium in 1946 was used chiefly by the glass blowing industry to polish and tint glass. It tinted glass a beautiful purple color, and it was used to polish the glass because it was very, you know, very smooth. The particles were very smooth and it was very heavy. So they used that to polish and tint glass. So it was very cheap. It was like 25 cents an ounce. And now it's more like a couple dollars, two or three dollars an ounce. So it's gone up like 100% or over as soon as the magnet companies found out, you know, in the mines and everything, everybody found out that you could make the most powerful magnets on Earth. With rare earths, they, they uh, raise the price tremendously for no reason other than it's, it's an energy source. And you can go back and do some research on uh, China, where China a couple years ago, almost exactly a couple years ago, restricted exports of neodymium and other rare earths to the West. And China, you know, rare earths are not rare. There are mountains of them. But only in certain countries around the world, you know, Australia has them, I believe Canada has them, 
Uh, Eastern Europe may have a lot of them. China has a lot of them. Um, the Chinese are no fools. <laughs> yeah, They're very, yeah. very, very bright, and they know that, uh, like uranium, rare earths are an energy source, and they continue to be an energy source. In uh, mag- uh, you know, rare earth magnets, you know, special alloy magnets make magnetic motors and generators possible. Because don't forget, Tim, and I know you've discovered this from your research too, magnets are gate pumps for the ether, or cosmic energy, vacuum energy, zero-point energy, quantum foam, Dirac sea of electrons, you name it, it's all the same thing, different names only. The, the vacuum, take little pieces of vacuum. Go look at, uh, at Tom Bearden's research, his new Tesla scalar electromagnetics. The vacuum is a source. Uh, look at Wheeler's work. My gosh, Wheeler calculated that uh, the vacuum has an equivalent energy density of 10 to the 94th power centimeter, cubic, per pu- cubic centimeter. So, you know, just think of how much energy that represents if you were able to liberate all the energy from that mass. And uh, it's, you know, un- unbelievably staggering amounts of energy. And it's been said quite accurately, you take one cubic meter of free space or vacuum, that has enough potential energy to uh, vaporize all Earth's oceans. So think about that. Way, way, way more energy than matter, antimatter annihilation. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, so, well, uh, now, R- Russell, let me steer you back towards the, the SEG for a moment, because what, what I wanted to do was I, I wanted to find out kind of where that's at and then how that leads towards the Searle IGV project, which I know is your own baby, just based on your expertise. Well, yeah, that's my baby, uh, Yes, sir, that's my baby, and oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. there is no better, cheaper, safer, faster way to, you know, for aerospace, air travel, you know, just simple air travel, as well as space travel. I mean, it's a no-brainer, it's, uh, and it has so many advantages, and uh, it's, it's really, really incredible that this came, this technology basically came from a series of two oddly recurring dreams that Professor Searle had as a young boy from age four to age ten. Well, now, and the dreams primarily uh, in, were, well, dream number one involved the game of hopscotch, which involves eight squares. That's very, very important if you want to understand the law of the squares. The law of the squares basically is a model for how nature coheres and polarizes this random vacuum flux to produce usable energy, whether electrical or mechanical. Okay. And uh, basically, if you have like two squared, the the, uh, SEG operates on two squares. In other words, four horizontals and four verticals. If you have consecutive numbers in all the horizontals and the verticals uh, squares, uh, think of magic squares and uh, the game, you know, that game, yeah, of, yeah. Uh, yeah, you think of that. If you have consecutive, the number's consecutive, and you take the sums of all the horizontals, the verticals and the diagonals, they'll all be different. However, if you randomize those numbers, and just think of the random vacuum flux, Wheeler said they were, you think of them as black holes and white holes popping in and out of existence at a very high frequency, or this random energy that's just shooting all over the place, you know, vacuum jitter, if you, just like the vacuum, randomize those numbers in the squares, do you know that you take all the horizontals, all the verticals, all the diagonals, they all are uniform now. These sums are all uniform, or the outputs, which is really, really interesting. So it's doing what nature does. That's why the squares are so important. And this numerical system goes way, 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 way back to the time of... uh, you know, ancient uh, India, ancient Atlantis, ancient, uh, you know, any megalithic society that, you know, pyramids building, ancient Egypt, which weren't the Egyptians, uh, the pyramids in, in the Americas and, uh, you know, the old world, all were built on these law of the squares principles. You talk about, uh, well, NASA has duplicated sonic levitation, where uh, it has uh, two uh, phases, two uh sound uh, waves at right angles, they're able to lift anything, and uh, that is on YouTube. They're using low power to lift lightweight objects. 
But uh, back around, uh, oh gosh, about 80, 90 years ago, there was an expedition, and this guy uh, was part of the, either the Royal Society or some German society, German scientific society, went to Tibet, and he had heard about Tibetan levitation and observed how it was being done. And that description is also online, and I highly recommend uh, people read it. It's also to be found in the book Anti-Gravity and the World Grid, okay, now, uh, edited now. by D.H. Childress, a sonic levitation uh, it's operating on very, very um, esoteric principles, but nevertheless, known principles of physics where you're influencing atoms at the nucleonic level to make them immune to gravity or beyond uh, gravitation, you know, anti-gravity. Yeah, so they no, no, they that, lose their weight and beyond. That's the squares. That's the law of the squares. Now, what, what was the other dream that Searle had had? Yeah, the other dream was where he there was like a shed uh, where he grew up, or a barn, or so, I believe it was a barn, rather, and he uh, is climbing a long ladder to get to the hayloft, and he gets up to the top of the ladder and opens a trap door, and around him there are uh, straws laid out in radial fashion, going from inward to outward, and uh, there's like uh, either 64 or 128 of them, you know, it's, it's, based on square of eight, basically eight squared is 64. Uh, so, you know, he sees these straws laid out, and not only that, there's a ring of fire at the very rim of this arrangement, indicating that what he was to build had a high concentration of energy at the rim. Okay. And, and in fact, that's what we see at uh, the rim of the IGV. That's where the uh, SEG, the flight SEG, is located near the rim. And it's all controlled from the outside of the SCG. Yeah. Now, now this this brings us back to current research because what's currently been built is a single ring system. And to make the IG or the Searle levity disk, the actual anti gravity craft, I understand that the research has to continue to to go to that second and then eventually the third, the third rim, the third layer of the SCG. Well, you could get you know one layer, uh, one ring and roller set to. Uh to fly if it's overloaded in the true law of the squares SEG with the laminated elements. Uh, two squared, four elements. You know, two squared is four, so four elements you need for a nominal SEG. You need an electron reservoir, because the whole point of the Searle effect, what happens, you know, you need 1.5 volts at uh, 200, or uh, rather 600 milliamps to get them rotating at 200 RPMs. Well, look at the Barrett report, and you can have people Google the Barrett report. Google the Barrett Report probes placed on the inner neodymium layers of SEG plates or runners and the outer copper or aluminum layers will show deflection in the needle of voltage anywhere from 3 to 12 volts. So that's more than enough to get the, rotate, the, uh, the runners rotating because as the experiments show, you only need 1.5 volts at 600 milliamps to get them up to uh, a really fast speed which is amazing. So what you're getting, because you have neodymium or any rare earth, well, neodymium is the cheapest rare earth, you have neodymium at the center, you have another element to act as a gate, uh, plastic material, plastics are good, good insulators, and then you have your electron accelerator, and that is the magnetized iron layer with the DC plus AC coil, and that makes the equivalent of pinpricks of magnetism all the way around the, uh, the plates and the runner's iron layers. And that acts like uh, perfectly spaced helical magnetic gears made out of magnetic fields. And then you have another layer, which is your paramagnetic layer, diamagnetic layer, I guess paramagnetic layer of copper or aluminum. And as you know, uh, next to strong magnetic fields, Aluminum or copper pulls away, or the ma the source of the magnetic field material will pull away, and uh, that's very important. What's formed is eddy currents, and those are opposing electrical fields that uh, repel each other, and uh, so the runners float above the plates while being locked magnetically mag from magnetic attraction of the two iron layers. North south, little all these pinpricks of north south poles, north south, north south, north south, north south, going all the way around, but not laid straight up and down in a helical skewed fashion. And there's a lot of advantages to helical gears, 
and I won't go into that right now, but uh, the listeners can look up uh, helical gears. In fact, a lot of the new, I'm a, I'm a helicopter pilot, and I, in fact, I was just down at the field of Valley Forge uh, flying one of my Airwolf uh, helicopters. Uh, the newest helicopters, the best ones, have helical gears for their main gears. And uh, it's really interesting. The helical gears uh, distribute the power more evenly and better and a whole lot of advantages to helical gears. But one of the most important advantages in the SEG is that they help to introduce disequilibrium in the system, which means that they're going to start moving. Well, what happens when you have this current flow of uh, electrons, um, negatively charged particles, uh, the positive hub, the inner neodymium layers are positive, the outer layer uh, copper or aluminum is negative, so positive at the center, negative at the rim. Well, you get a current flow. Uh, the disparate polarities produce a current flow. Well, what happens when you have current flow in the presence of a magnetic field? That's what we call an electric motor. Well, so basically... So, think of, so Tim, think of the uh, staters and the runners of the SEG as individual little generators. Think of them as permanent batteries that never run down. You know, the, the uh, great thing about neodymium or any rare earth is that they have extra electrons in their outer 4F and 5F band shells or electron cloud uh, layers. And uh, these rare earths like neodymium readily give up and greedily suck up electrons from the environment. Well, there are electrons everywhere, even in the vacuum. In fact, uh, Nobel winner Dirac called the vacuum a sea of electrons, which is very important and dovetails with a lot of other research in uh, newer physics. Uh, oh, so you're saying that the, the SEG, so it is harnessing vacuum energy. It's, because basically, it it's basically swimming in a sea of electrons. Yeah. Vacuum, you could think of vacuum as uh, pre-electrons or, or virtual electrons. Uh, you can, you know, wang the, the vacuum to give up all its electron volts in the form of an atomic bomb. Or you can gently stroke the vacuum, which is what the SEG does, to make its soft electrons give up harder electrons, which are matter. Matter, uh, after all, the most fundamental element of uh, matter is the electron. Yeah, yeah. So with with the SEG now, they, they've constructed the 200 RPM model. Now, one thing I should ask is... Have they seen the onset of the, the, the classic Searle effects yet? And I know there are a number of effects there. Have they seen those, or are they still below the threshold? Well, the, Searle, the basic Searle effect is just to get the rollers rotating, and we've seen that for like the past six years. The first real SEG model I saw was at Kofi 2, the Conference on Future Energy 2, sponsored by Tom Vallone and the Integrity Institute down in Washington, D.C., in uh, September of 2006. And uh, just on the heck of it, Fernando Morris said, hey, maybe we can get this to motor, as they did the old SEGs. Uh, first, uh, if the fields weren't quite right, they'd have to impose, superimpose a field on them to get them rotating. And past a certain rotational speed, they're on their own. And they could take the field away, and there was no way to shut them down. Now, if the fields are perfectly true, you won't have to do that. As soon as you place the runners... On the plates, they start rotating one after another, after another, after another. And if you have soft iron, C-shaped soft iron cores wound with copper coils, that will, of course, there'll be cutting lines of magnetic force uh, in an electrical generator to generate electricity. You can either move the magnetic field or you can move the conductor. Well, of course, in the SEG, you're moving the magnetic field. You're moving the magnets, and the conductors are stators. And uh, it's basically like a brushless motor. But uh, unlike a brushless motor, it's not only just cutting lines of magnetic force. Electrons by the trillions and trillions and trillions are streaming off radially off the rim of the SEG, just being inserted, flying into the coils. Think of it like, uh, think of the runners like a wet tire throwing off rain on a wet road. Mm, okay, okay. And think of the fluid analysis, which Tesla often liked to use. Tesla says fluid modeling, visual modeling, is better, far better than any esoteric mathematics you could use. Yeah. Although mathematics has its place, and it's very, very helpful. Uh, in fact, mathematics describes how you can build these things. But it's not your normal math. It's a simpler kind of math. 
and uh, there's there are three groups of squares and only three groups of squares. Uh, square group one, uh, you get uh, oscillation. Uh, square group two, you get uh, a rotation. And square group three, you get an oscillation with a rotating cross at the center. Ah, okay. And I, okay. And I believe that the uh, normal nominal SEG is square three, square group three, or class three class three rather yeah. so research the law of the squares it's really interesting and it's if you get your your sums right by obeying the law of the squares you'll get a perfect flow of electricity or electric current or electrons uh from uh, the inner layer to the outer layer now for nano morris then you'd said even though it wasn't perfectly aligned he was able to get it to self-rotate no 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 um, back in some earlier experiments, back, uh, I guess, uh, like about 10 years ago, maybe 9, 10 years ago in Germany, they were building SEGs, and uh, I saw a video on the, uh, I guess it is the, uh, oh, God, the Disk Limited site, uh, uh, Effect.com. That's uh, John Thomas's site. There's a video, and uh, there's an imperfection in the SEG. Professor Searle is just placing an iron layer, uh, iron ring, that's been magnetized Searle fashion to uh, another larger iron ring, which is the stator. And as soon as he places it, the two parts are in contact. The iron ring starts rotating and orbiting around mm, okay. and stops about halfway around because there's a crack. Uh, the... Uh, manufacturing process didn't turn out quite right and there's a crack in the material you can't have any cracks in the material this is made the old way by sintering powders of uh, the different elements and uh, I don't know if it, if it was me or someone else I think I suggested to John Thomas well you know back in the day they used to have to handle the neodymium in an argon box because neodymium on exposure to air corrodes very rapidly and then it's unusable so to get around that um, they recalculated the squares laboriously and uh, used a uh, nickel blend in other words an alloy of neodymium uh, blended with nickel so that it doesn't uh, oxidize and you know the musical instrument musical instrument strings I'm a you know guitarist cellist bass player and uh, musical instrument strings uh, normally have a nickel plating to keep them from oxidizing as well, because steel, uh, when it's exposed to oxygen in the air, oxidizes very rapidly, which means rusts, you know, and at which point it degrades, the sound quality degrades very rapidly. So the nickel plating keeps that from happening. The same thing, nickel nickel uh, plating in the uh, the neodymium and the SEG keeps that from happening as well. It keeps it from oxidizing. Oh, okay. Okay. So, so this so, is actually uh, a modification need... that, that you suggested that led to this new, in a sense, because it led it's to just, a... Yeah, it's just logic. And not only that, instead of using powders of material, they're using tubes of material and then machining them okay. to avoid the costly and laborious step of sintering, that is, compressing uh, things under very high pressure and heat. So they're just machining the elements and pressing them together in a uh, magnet press. Uh, you know, that's a very mechanical device that uh, presses layers of different different elements together under tons of pressure. Well, now let let me ask with the IGV. Then I I understand that there's some there's there's always the funding issue at work. But how far away do you think the 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 levity disc may be? Because there's so much progress being made with the SEG itself. <laughs> It's not that far, you know. Uh, we just need probably about uh, five hundred, six hundred thousand uh, dollars at our present level of uh, SEC, uh, FEC rather, uh, Corporation five hundred one. We're allowed to raise a million dollars, or just under, rather, just under a million dollars. That's nine hundred ninety-nine thousand dollars ninety-nine cents, <laughs> basically, uh, just under a million dollars. You know, to avoid any problems with uh, the uh, the SEC or IRS, and uh, with that, we are able to start have a nice start on the materials we need and the funding we need to get uh, everything going on the domestic SEG prototypes, which are level two square or rather level four square. That's two squared, four elements. Two squared is four, so four elements is your nominal SEG. 
And uh, your SCG, the interesting thing about it, it works on the principles of negative energy or negative entropy or neg entropy, as Tom Bearden calls it. Uh, things seem to work in reverse. On all conventional generators, even the uh, Howard Johnson uh, magnetic motor that's hooked up to a generator, uh, the more load you put on it, the hotter the generator, the uh, basic, uh, you know, uh, dynamo gets, the hotter it gets, and the slower it runs until it eventually stops if you put too much load on it. Well, the SEG doesn't work like that. It puts out a cold current because of the negative resistance of all the electrons flying into the windings. Cold current. So uh, what you're getting, if you put a load on it, it speeds up. It works the opposite, which is very, very interesting. It uh, is very confounding to someone who has been uh, studying conventional, classical electrodynamics all their life, and here's something that doesn't obey those laws. It works in the opposite fashion. If you put a load on it, it gets colder and it speeds up. Not only that, past a certain threshold, it will also get lighter. In other words, it, uh, it weighs less. As the temperature is diving down, diving down because of all the electrons flowing through it and creating negative resistance, cool instead of heat. Uh, what happens when it reaches 4 Kelvin, you've overloaded it, the neodymium starts superconducting. The neodymium becomes a high-temperature superconductor. High temperature in, in terms that normal to get a superconductor normally, you have to use uh, super-chilled uh, uh, elements such as liquid nitrogen. Well... When you're overloading the SCG, it gets down to a certain point when it's uh, overloaded. It's 4 Kelvin. At that point, the voltage that's going out of it is incredible. It's unbelievable. And yeah. it's a very low, very low amperage, only about uh, 1.5 milliamps. Whatever the power level, the current stays at 1.5 milliamps, which is very interesting. It's high-energy electrostatics. Oh, okay. Very, very okay. interesting, like the Brown effect that I use in uh, Applied Electrovitics, the T.T. Brown, the Phil Brown effect. Uh, we only need very, very low current. In the vacuum, you can turn the current down even lower to get the same or more effect. So it's more efficient in the vacuum. Anyway, uh, that's, that's an aside. Uh, basically, what happens when it starts the neodymium or whatever rare earth you're using as an electron reservoir, Starts super turns into a superconductor. At that point, voltage goes unlimited. You uh, open the vacuum floodgates, and uh, the SEG and anything attached to it loses all inertia. At the same time, Professor Searle figures the Earth repels it, and inside the inner ring or inner one third of the device, you have a one half g gravitational field. So. Basically, Professor Searle says, well, two like fields repel. Two gravity fields repel. Well, up until the SEG, we had no real way of producing a gravity field. But it's produ the voltage is so much, as we know from relativity, energy and mass are equivalent. You access gravitation by having a large localized concentration of mass or a large localized concentration of energy. Yeah. Well. In the SCG, we have a large localized concentration of stupendous electrostatic potential, which is energy, and uh, you have your gravity field, and you have no inertia, and uh, the Earth's field, what I'm thinking also, is that since you have a very, very, very high negative field at the rim, uh, in other words, electrons, electron surplus at the rim, electron deficit of the hub, in other words, positive of the hub, negative of the rim, you have... Uh, something that will repel from the rim. The Earth's surface is negatively charged, highly negatively charged by trillions, if not billions of volts. And, of course, like the bird on the wire, we're immersed in this electrical field and don't feel a, a bit of it. Yeah, yeah, that makes, that makes so, total sense. So what is happening also, not only is a superconductor repelled from a magne magnetic field, well, the Earth's magnetic field is stronger than its surface, it's being repelled, a superconductor is repelled from a magnetic field by quantum uh, and, uh, quantum displacement. And we've seen those videos online, too. It's very, very stable, as is the IGV in flight. It's silent and extremely stable. 
uh, what's happening is you have highly negative charge at the rim and a highly negative charge at the Earth. Those two like polarities will repel with great force. But you have a highly charged center. And in fact, if the, the SEG drive is switched on very rapidly and it's uh, repelled from the Earth, it will take uh, used to take up a chunk of Earth with it. It's one reason the landing legs have to be so long. At the center is a, uh, an attraction zone which could be used to pick up almost anything and hold it there. As we know from P, uh, P. A. La Violette's Subquantum Kinetics, which I highly recommend everyone read, as well as his newer book, came out in uh, 2008, exactly four years ago, Secrets of Anti-Gravity Propulsion. In Subquantum Kinetics, positive charges attract and negative charges repel. And in fact, Tim, we see this in the T.T. Brown saucers that I built and devices that I sell and levitating devices that I fly. I've built the T.T. Brown saucers since 1990. What happens is, basically, the, there's a positive field around the anode wire or copper tube or whatever, and the saucer is charged negative chassis ground, like every other aircraft or car or device or whatever. Um, so negative chassis ground, it's going to be pulled in to the positive pole of the ahead of the device very, very rapidly with great force. And the higher the voltage, and it's extremely dependent on voltage, in fact, solely dependent on voltage, the higher the voltage, the more the Coulomb's force attraction oh, of the device okay. of the saucer for the anode. And in fact, in the more advanced saucers, which uh, started coming around, oh gosh, I guess in Germany, World War II, mid to late 1940s, one reason they had Operation Paperclip <laughs> is not just for the uh, V to the A4, Hitler's A4, uh, which was uh, von Braun's. It was for all the other German saucer scientists like Miethe, Schriever, Habermol, and, of course, Victor Schauberger. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, his, his work you know, showed how you can build up tremendous voltage with just a spiral of air or water. That's the key, the voltage. It's, it becomes tremendous. And in and a with, sense, this rotating, the rotating vortices, this ties back into the SEG in many ways. It ties back into a lot of anti-gravity uh, theoretical and uh, actual working devices. Look at the uh, patent, French patent by Marcel Page. Look at uh, Petit Vuitton's work. Look at, uh, oh God, um, of course, Victor Schauberger. But Burkhard Heim's contrabaric effect, that's the Searle effect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, basically, yeah, Marcel Page is said if you take a charge of electrons, extract a charge of electrons from any body, and rotate that charge of electrons around that body, the uh, body will degravitate. Mm, okay, okay. And that's what we see in all these solid state and rotary anti gravity generator devices. And there's a lot of them out there, there's a lot of patents out there. And uh, people say, oh, well, patents don't work. There's no proof. Anybody can get a patent. Well, in my experience, uh, all the patents that I have built, they have worked as good or better than as claimed in the patent. So that argument just doesn't fly to, uh, you know, pun intended, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. So anyway. Yeah. Well, anyway. And and I'm I'm hoping that with you know with the with the IGV when you get that built you know that that would be I think that'll be a wonderful breakthrough and you know I, I, well it's it's proven technology we don't have to reinvent the wheel here we just have to rebuild the technology and don't forget like the atomic bomb or hydrogen bomb even the IGV is low tech everything that started to come around in the 60s, 70s, 80s, that's all high-tech, it's ancillary devices. The IGV is, and the Brown devices are low-tech. Yeah, yeah, and that, that makes it, I think, a little more robust. Well, absolutely, yes. And uh, one thing, you know, you have to have your spaceport, your IGV spaceport, located at least two miles away from highways or other airports because it produces massive massive, you know what, R RF and EM interference. In fact, at one one point, uh, IGV blanked out ground-to-air transmissions from an airport in southern England. And uh, there were 41, 42 models built, flown from uh, Warminster and Berkshire, England. And in fact, the P-11, P-12s were stored in Archangel, Russia, uh, an agreement with Russian scientists because there was no place to house them for safety's sake 
in the UK. Don't forget, they had no way, once the generators were started, they had no way of stopping them until 1969 or 70. I believe it was 1970. Professor Searle was on a Canadian TV program, and the SEG was going. And he had just finished saying, once they're started, there's no way to stop them. The camera panned down from Professor Searle's face to the SEG. At that point, the SEG slowed and stopped. And Professor Searle's mouth fell open, and the camera went up immediately to catch his expression, which was one of total shock and surprise. Immediately after that, the runners started rotating again. The SEG started rotating again. At that point, Professor Searle knew how to slow and stop the SEG for even greater flight control. What was happening was that the camera has an oscillator tube, and that oscillator tube was making an artificial pole on the outer set of runners just passing. And that was introducing equilibrium into the system that had disequilibrium, which caused the rollers to stop. Uh -huh. And since that, in every uh, IGV, they would have a camera oscillator tube to control the speed of the SEG, which would also control the SEG's lift, ancillary or main control, and its speed in forward flight. And its speed in forward flight is much faster than any rocket with no sonic boom, no noise, and uh, no inertia. Yeah. But there is one half G onboard gravity. So in spacecraft, you, uh, you have a condition where the bones and joints of astronauts do not degenerate from lack of gravity. And uh, I should mention that also at anything from a half a million to a million volts, which is on the very, very low side of SEG power and idle, no air can come near the device. So in a man craft, it's just pushed away like everything else. There's a force field at the rim because of negative charges. Don't forget, negative charges and subquantum kinetics repel, and positive charges attract. <coughs> Excuse me. So no air can come near the SEG at anything from 500,000 to a million volts, which is, you know, nominal SEG at idle, very low, very, very, very low rotational speed, low power. So for a man craft, you have to have life support system. So uh, in the early 70s, NASA was in contact with Professor Searle, and Dr. Arthur Kane from NASA worked with the team in, in various photographs. So the Demo-1, the 21-footer, the last craft built, 7-meter craft, was seen wiring up the craft. This, uh, the uh, wiring buses and uh, wiring blocks were all on the outside of the uh, inner cabin wall, rather, outside of the inner cabin wall. And those wires would go out to the controlling flight cells, 64 struts making up the profile of the SEG in radial fashion, and 64 flight cells or flight control cells. And uh, for uh, the uh, normal flight, you wouldn't really need anything on the external to control it. But because of... Uh, Oh, gosh, Civil Aeronautics Board said, well, you know, what if you have a power out condition? How are you going to glide the thing down? He has these flight cells rotate from zero degrees to 90 degrees for regular aerodynamic control in a power out glide condition. The, uh, I, the uh, sort of levity disc or IGV should be able to glide very nicely in a power out glide condition, but that wouldn't really happen because there's no way to shut it down. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, what happens is you have uh, four flight cell conditions. Flight cell open, flight cell closed, flight cell open and locked, flight cell closed and locked. And how you control the SEG for flight is a touch control and electronic control, two different systems. Inside each flight cell, of course, is a load cell, and uh, there's a needle or pin, a rim discharge pin, coming out of the edge of each flight cell, and uh, what happens is you're starting the SEG and putting it into a superconductive state for flight by letting the output of it overload on the atmosphere in a corona surrounding the device. And that makes a blue and then pinkish halo at higher power. Pinkish because there's a drop in pressure, drop in air pressure around the device. Oh, okay. Higher, higher the voltage the more air is pushed away. Yeah, and then and you pick stronger. up nitrogen glow from the atmosphere. Right. Nitrogen or whatever other gases, uh, you know, noble gases, whatever, oxygen. Uh, so the higher the voltage, the stronger the vacuum surrounding the device, the vacuum envelope. So anyway, what controls it is uh, 64 switches, 64 channels of the 12-meter, they used to use 12-meter ham radio, 
and it was a very, very powerful signal. It was one of the few signals they could get through normally the device is radar invisible. It's invisible to radar frequencies. It was really interesting. They used to track it through a pinger, mm, okay. uh, you know, which is really interesting, too. So uh, what they'd have is that uh, when a flight cell is activated, it turns from zero degrees to 90 degrees, and at the same time fires a solenoid a relay, solenoid through a tube, through a hole in the outer SEG housing wall. And that strikes a runner just passing or set of runners just passing. At that point, just like touching the wheel of a gyro, the rotor of a gyro, the SEG drops at that 164th of its circumference. Or in the case of the what I've seen, you know, the film loops of the control and from Warminster, they used to activate the flight cells in quadrants of 16 flight cells each. And that point would just drop, and then the SCG would, uh, or the IGV rather, would travel off in that direction. And if that tilt was maintained, just like a helicopter, it would fly off rapidly in the direction of that tilt. And simultaneously with that, there are four switches, and they would uh, either make the upper shells positive or negative or oppositely charged for even further flight control and send a different polarity out through the rim discharge pins. Well, Russell, let me let me redirect you for just a second. Let me let, let's go back to the the IGV construction project, if if possible. One of the things that I'd like to to ask you is, um, you know, when 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 the money has been raised, when funding is in place, um, what are your plans to move forward with that? Well, we're going to have a facility, uh, two facilities possibly. First facility will be here in southeastern Pennsylvania, in the rolling farmlands of southeastern Pennsylvania. And that will be a prime location of Searle Aerospace, Inc. And we'll have a second location in Southern California, right adjacent to Searle Magnetics. So uh, I guess I'll be shuttling back and forth between L.A. and uh, Pennsylvania. That's okay. I like to travel. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we will have uh, two facilities. And it's just going to be very exciting work. Um, Possibly locating uh, here, around somewhere around here, maybe in an abandoned aircraft hangar, something like that. Yeah, a lot of aerospace companies around here. There's Boeing, there's Lockheed Martin, there's uh, Piasecki helicopters, Sikorsky helicop- uh, helicopters. A lot of aircraft companies just within a two mile radius. Two miles, actually, very interesting thing. Two miles from me, in King of Prussia, PA. Uh, it used to be GE Aerospace, uh, now it's uh, Lockheed Martin. In the late 70s, 80s, it was uh, Martin Marietta. But uh, anyway, T. Townsend Brown, Thomas Townsend Brown, did some very important vacuum chamber work with his disc airfoils in 1959. Uh, that was after his vacuum, successful vacuum and other experiments in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, in the late 50s. In 1959, here in GE Aerospace, two miles from me, right across from the big King of Prussia Mall, uh, he confirmed that uh, his uh, electrified disc airfoils work as well or better in hardest vacuum. Well, and that's something that we might want to come back to in the future, but for today we're almost out of time. So I, I want to say thank you again. I sincerely appreciate your time and, and the, the detail of, of explanation that you provided on both the SEG, the IGV, and what the company is working on. Oh, you're you're welcome, Tim. It's great to talk to you again. Uh, I could be more detailed, but of course we have a limited time. And I will be having a more detailed uh, lecture this fall. Uh, I'm lecturing on the 9th of November at the Global Breakthrough Energy Conference at uh, Hilversum, Holland, over in Europe this November, second weekend of November. And where can people find information about that if they want to attend? Yeah, go to www.globalbem.com for Breakthrough Energy Movement, globalbem.com. And you can find out all about the speakers and a couple other Team Searle members are speaking and presenting there also, Fernando Vosa, most notably, and uh, I think Cara Fay is also going to be uh, showing another Searle film. I'll have a table set up to, Searle, to sell Searle uh, Sorry videos. Uh, if anybody hasn't seen it already, I highly recommend you go to johnsearlestory.com and uh, you can either buy the DVD or download the video and find out about the history and present-day work 
getting this very, very, very important work done. And it, this is our future. This and other work going on by other groups like the Keshi Foundation and other groups is going to get us to a point of a world where, where everyone wants clean energy, unlimited energy that everyone can afford, even in the most remote part of the world. And uh, that's going to you know, really make it a golden age. And that's the most uh, much prophesied golden age of Aquarius. That's coming. It's here now. 